synchronize everything. Okay. Okay, so um, today we're here with AJ to talk about God's attributes and qualities. Are you here with it, Lily? <laughs> we're here with AJ, Miller. <laughs> Are you with Lily? I'm with Jesus. <laughs> uh, see, you see, they still haven't dealt with the emotions, have they? Not all of them. <laughs> uh, you want to start again? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so today we're here with... You don't have to say it, Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> you got your voice back, I can see. It. You, can <laughs> you can say AJ, that's fine. Oh, thank you. Just thank stare you. on you. <laughs> okay. <Yeah>. Okay. Um. <laughs> now water, and then we can start. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like very few people have dealt with the issues still. Um, and it's interesting that the media keeps going back to that 2009 or whatever it was, 10 talk that I did saying, I'm Jesus, Jesus, deal with it. <laughs> and yet nobody who's listening to me still has really dealt with it. <laughs> uh, which is okay. <laughs> Far away, Lily. Okay. That, that little bit at the front is fine on there if you want. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, okay, so today we're here with AJ Miller and we're going to be talking about God's attributes and qualities. And my name is Lily Thaler and I'm the interviewer today. That's good, Lily. Cool. What's your background, Lily? Oh, I was a neuroscientist and I'm currently not working. You're currently not working. Yeah. You're currently living nearby us as well, aren't you? I am. Yeah. yeah. Growing the, vegetables. Growing vegetables yes. instead of being a neuroscientist. That's right. Mm, interesting change. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the only thing you're doing, though. No, I'm quite busy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, um, did you want to say about the office? Um, yes, what I would probably like to say firstly to the viewers is that um, we are actually now inviting any member of the public or any person uh, who is connected with Divine Truth in any way to interview us. They need to be respectful in the way that they interview and they also need to be aware that there might be a group of questions that, are, that exceed the amount of questions they have personally asked uh, that will be added to their interview but we'd be happy to have different people interviewing us from the public as long as they are con content to actually have these interviews placed on YouTube. And the reason why we're doing that is that uh, some people will be asking more introductory type of material that uh, would best be answered through the interview process um, and then presented to the public in an introductory manner. So, so we feel that there'll be, in the future there'll be all so sorts of people wanting to do different interviews including people wanting to interview us about religious matters, first century life, like current life, um, and lots of different subjects, basic subjects that we've probably already covered in seminars as well. Now, if people want to be involved in the interview process, that all they need to do is interview, uh, uh, send an email, sorry, to office at divinetruth.com, and, uh, and then um, that process will be engaged and uh, they have to nominate the subject that would, they would like to interview me on and also there needs to be a willingness to sign a waiver saying that the interview material um, will be placed in public domain for free. But aside from that there's no other requirements um, aside from somebody being passionate about the subject that they're interviewing about. So, so we, f we feel that that would be an interesting process in the future to engage interviews from all sorts of backgrounds. Mm. So that was the introductory for this, and that could place it probably be placed on a separate, uh, uh, just a separate basic file as well, Igor. Yeah. Um, we feel that the interview process is a very important process to in help engage people in this process of asking questions and getting answers. And so it would be fantastic if, if many different people from all sorts of walks of life would be willing to interview at some point. Okay, well, let's proceed on this particular subject, shall we? Yep. Okay, so, um, well, I've got, obviously, a lot of questions. 
this interview could take infinity. <laughs> so what's the subject? <laughs> the subject is God's attributes and qualities. Mm-hmm. Um, so just to start off with, I feel like we should um, cover evidence that there is actually a God. Right. Um, so when I met you, I was an atheist scientist. Right. And, you know, so you were an atheist scientist. I was an atheist scientist, you know, traditional atheist scientist. Do you mind me asking you why you were an atheist? Had you given it much thought, or you? I just put all um, all my faith in science, really, and evolution. Right. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. I felt that there was other things. Unknown things. Yeah, but I thought that science would explain a lot. Right, and science would, would be able to explain those other things from a purely physical investigation of science. Is that what you felt? Eventually, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah. Um, so then what happened was I met you, and mm-hmm. then um, I started uh, implementing your your teachings to get in touch with my feelings, long for divine love. Yeah. May I ask you what caused you to uh, get in, uh, do that? Like, it's a pretty unusual thing for somebody to do right at the beginning. Um, I, well, I did have a history of of um, of doing yoga, so right. I had experience chi flow and things like that. Right. So, so I was interested in that kind of thing, and I'd. Is it also because you're a scientist and you love experimenting? Is that part yeah, of it as well? and you said you could explain the secrets of the universe, and I said, yes, thank you. <laughs> no <laughs> worries. To that. No worries. Yeah, so, so that was got me, got me interested. Yep. Um, and I was just obviously intrigued because you said you were Jesus. Right, yeah. Yep. Um, so anyway, um, the way you explained to find out where there was a God was to connect your feelings along with divine love. Yeah. And I did that, yeah. and then I started receiving divine love, right. and then that convinced me over time that there is a God that exists. Yeah. So is it possible to prove that there is a God through experimentation that's not just like through a subjective experience? Uh, definitely. Of course, that would be the case, you would, you would think, wouldn't you? Um, and so, yes, there are ways to experiment with God's existence uh, scientifically, rather than actually doing it on a personal level. The the difference between the two is that if you do it on a personal level, you enter this personal relationship with God, which you've started to discover. Whereas if you do it on a purely scientific level, you could find out that a God exists, but still not have a personal relationship with that being. So, so while the experimental process can be valid, you know, a valid way of discovering the truth of God's existence, it's not a very valid way of d- demonstrating or, or developing a relationship with that God. And, uh, and so there are many scientists uh, who have passed over into the spirit world in particular who, who do believe now that there is a God, but they still do not have a personal relationship with that God. In fact, uh, they sort of have a viewpoint that God is so large, uh, potentially, that they feel it's probably impossible to have a personal relationship with that God is what their personal feelings are about the matter. So when you speak with different spirits when you're in the spirit world who come from Earth with a scientific background, you often find that they do believe there is a God, particularly by the time they've reached the sixth dimension, many of them do believe there is a God, but they uh, find it very difficult to accept that you can have a personal relationship with that God. Um, The beauty of experimenting with the personal relationship is you discover that a personal relationship is possible very early in the piece, but also you gain a lot of extra knowledge and uh, and your viewpoint widens very rapidly with regard to the types of experiments you could actually undertake, as you've discovered yourself. So now, you know, with what you're doing, I think, with the soul-based team, the Soul God's Way of Love team, is experimenting with with different scientific principles with regard to emotions which is which is something that not very many scientists do until they're well into the spirit world into the the upper dimensions of the spirit world Mm. okay so is it your intention to try and prove why on earth that god does exist um well there's two parts, I suppose you could say, to the intention of returning to Earth. One part is, yes, to, to prove that God does exist. But while proving God does exist has a benefit to mankind, it, it doesn't actually have much personal benefit to the individual. So there is the second part, which is proving that a personal relationship with God actually can be developed and also 
causes major changes within the individual themselves and the way they develop and, and their capacity to and their pe personal power, their power to do different things. And so it's very important to understand that even though we may believe there is a God, it doesn't necessarily mean that that belief will translate into a relationship with God. And so this is why I feel um, it's very important for most people to understand that that we can develop uh, methods to discover scientifically whether God exists or not, and even to discover whether spirit world exists or the other dimensional spaces that I've referred to exist. We can design experiments to prove the existence of those dimensional spaces scientifically. However, even if we provide that evidence and proof, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person will have a personal experience with God and actually engage this process of personal growth through the process. And what I'm trying to do is encourage both of those things, not just one. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of answering your question about scientific experiments that you could perform to, to examine whether God exists or not, many of those experiments involve things that mankind are currently uh, limited in terms of the way they experiment. Um, so, for example, some of them involve the discovery of new particles that we will need to discover through some scientific exp experiments that are based around physics. Other experiments will be based around the emotions and how ex experimenting with, uh, and this has already begun on Earth, but experimenting with the transmission of information via emotions between, for example, a mother and a child and, and between people. Um, in different locations on Earth and to see what kind of instantaneous effect that that has. And in those kind of experiments, you'll discover that um, we can transmit thoughts and feelings faster than the speed of light. And so therefore we discover that the speed of light is not the limiting factor in terms of communication and transportation. And, and through a, a number of other different experiments, we can, dis we can find that there has to be a creator of these particular things through a number of different experiments that we could undertake. Rather than going into those experiments at this point, um, I feel those experiments are very complicated in comparison to the experiment that you undertook uh, by, uh, via suggestion right at the beginning of the process of meeting me. And that, that experiment is very simple. And, and very easy to undertake, doesn't require much setup, and it doesn't require any measuring instruments or anything like that other than your own feelings and, and emotions and sensations in your own physical form. And also um, the ability, as you have known and, and worked on yourself, the, there is an effect on your brain and on your body that can be measured. So we, if we had the appropriate apparatus, we could actually measure those effects initially and therefore prove quite rapidly that a personal relationship with God is available and therefore God must also exist. Mm. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Right. So um, we'll just assume that God does exist for the rest <laughs> of the purpose of this conversation. Yes, I suppose you need to. Um, uh, the question of God's existence is a completely different subject yeah. and I feel that it's a subject that is worthy of attention uh, and worthy of discussion. And I feel at some point in the future we'll, we'll provide some information about experiments that can be undertaken to prove the existence of the spirit world, uh, multidimensional spaces, God's existence, and, and people in other forms existing, uh, as well as answering a lot of other questions that, uh, that I've been putting forward as statements about divine truth. Yeah. Okay. So um, is it possible that there's not just one God, and that God is like a child of another God? Well, that, that is possible. Um, but answering the question is very, very difficult. Um, and the best thing I can say about those kind of questions are that they are yet to be resolved, and as a result of them yet to be resolved, there is the possibility of the, of the potential of it existing. Um, it's like most questions. There are, there are groups of questions that we can resolve quite rapidly, and then there are other groups of questions that are very, very difficult to resolve because of their nature. The, the questions surrounding God and how God came into existence are very, very difficult to resolve because we, we have no strong way of being able to measure how God came into existence. And the main reason why is it's like, a, it's like the creation trying to understand the creator. So, so imagine for a moment you made a car and you built the car 
and, um, and then you ask the car to understand you. Now, it would be very, very difficult for the car to understand you without having your intelligence, your feelings, your emotions, your, your capacity to absorb information, and obviously anything you create probably will not have the same capacity as yourself. And for that reason, the thing you create will find it very, very difficult to understand you completely, it, even if it has intelligence. And, and even if you've given it intelligence, the, the way, a method of, of examining through experimentation or through personal uh, relationship, um, either method, it's still going to be quite difficult to understand some parts of the person who created you. Okay. Yeah. So this is probably another one of those questions, but Good. I'm going to ask anyway. Yeah. God created the universe, and the universe is... Um, <coughs> 13.7 billion years old or something like that? Yeah, close to 14 billion, shall we say, as a round figure, uh, years old, the physical universe that we exist in currently. So do not assume that that is the only universe that has ever been created. Um, there could be potentially universes side by side physically in, in, in space from each other. So, so that, that is a potential as well. So we can't say that the only universe that was ever created has, is 14 billion years old. We can only say that due to different scientific measurements that we can currently make, there are, we can make some assumptions based on different f theories and then base the, the age of the current physical universe as around about, that, uh, around about 14 billion years old. OK, so um, how old does that make God? Well, obviously, God has to be older than that. Yes. Um, for God to have created the universe itself, then God has to be older than the universe itself. Also, it also makes sense, if you, if you look at it, that if God created the physical universe and the other dimensional spaces, then, then God has to exist outside of those dimensional spaces and, and outside of that universe. It doesn't mean that God can't get into the universe somehow, because there's a possibility of that occurring, just like you can create a car and then you can jump inside of it and use it. And uh, there is also the possibility that God could do a very similar thing, you know, create a universe and then jump inside the universe and utilise it in some way. Um, however, the existence of the universe, being that it existed after God, therefore it, I w we would have to assume from that that God has to be older than that universe and also uh, greater in power than the universe that was created and also um, utilising something, other forms of energy which we have yet to discover, um, to create that universe as well. So there's quite a number of things we can assume once we start understanding that God is an entity and we also understand that God existed before the universe created. Okay, so you don't know how old God is? No idea how, God, how old God is. Um, at all. And uh, at this stage, my presumption is that God is possibly infinite in time, and I don't understand yet emo emotionally or intellectually how that could be the case. Um, but um, there is no other possible presumption if you think about it, because it's a bit like if, if God as an entity does exist, then, then um, the it explains the universe spontaneity in terms of coming into existence but how did God come into existence um, it would not make sense that intelligence came from no source and obviously you know if you look at the intelligence in the universe and all of the laws involved in the universe that we currently have the physical laws as well as the other laws that mankind has yet to discover all tend to indicate highly intelligent being in terms of uh, creation of the universe and if that is the case then where did that intelligence come from if it spontaneously came into existence it doesn't make much sense so um, we don't really know those particular things about God all we can do is examine God's creation and through this personal relationship with God discover quite a lot of God's attributes and qualities that way but what we my assumptions at this point in time are that God has infinitely existed and that God has an infinite number of qualities to actually discover. That being the case, I will spend the rest of my existence discovering them, and, uh, but I will also, during that period, find a lot of answers about the universe itself, that I live, myself, uh, you and other people, how we all exist, how we all function, and there is the large potential of myself growing to such a condition that we know, and, and each person who's ever existed coming to such a condition, that we know large amounts about the universe 
and large amounts about ourselves and large amounts about each other, but still know, in comparison, quite a small amount about God. Hmm. Okay, so you said that God is located outside the universe. Um, in one particular place or, like, all around? Well, since it's impossible for me to get outside of the universe myself and impossible for any being God has created, in fact, at this point in time to exist outside of the universe, it's impossible also to answer that question as to where God's presence is outside of the universe in terms of its localised place. It is possible, though, to answer the question as to um, how that presence is felt and how that presence is observed throughout the universe. And so it's possible to discover those kind of questions and answer those kind of questions, but I do not believe it is possible at this point to answer the question of where is God's localised existence, assuming God is an entity of some form, where is God's localised existence outside of the universe? We can only assume through, through our logical reasoning that God must exist outside the universe if the universe was created after God existed. So um, you said it's possible for God to come into the universe. Yes. Has God ever come into the universe that you know of? God comes in the universe constantly. Parts of God or all of God? Uh, parts of God um, come into the universe constantly. Um, I have, I'm have. i pretty sure that if God entered the universe fully, we would all be squashed. Be pretty, oh, not so much squashed because it depends on the condition that we're in and whether we're at one with God or not as to whether we could absorb that energetically so my fe feelings are that god at this point has not ever fully entered the universe but uh, but and in fact god's love one of god's major attributes has never fully entered the universe at this point either um, and again if we assume that god is infinite in nature and therefore god's qualities must be infinite in nature we can see that uh, it would be impossible for god's infinite love to enter the universe without it being a gradualized process where where it, where, where it gradually in, increases in its intensity to a certain point. To, for God's love to enter the universe all at once would be a physical impossibility as well. Right. Mm. So, um, uh, God is obviously massively large, you assume. We assume. You assume. Um, when, I say, when we say massively large, it would probably be better to use the term... But remember that God is obviously made up of different dimensional matter than we are made up of. Um, obviously, it's the same with regard to us when we create some kind of uh, object ourselves. Like, you know, any object that we have around us that we create ourselves, it, it is created in, in, a, in, a, in a little different way. For instance, the whiteboard or the recording material... Um, your own paper, all of those kind of things, they are physical matter still. They are all still atomic structures, you know, with very, very rapidly rotating uh, energy particles. Um, but, but the matter that's in your body is very different because it has the ability to live. There's a breath of life that exists in it, whereas the breath of life in the paper, for example, has, has disappeared. And so anything that man creates at this point in time none of it really seems to have the breath of life in it, uh, whereas all the things that God has created all seem to have a breath of life in them. You know, when you look at the majority of them, uh, there's the in inanimate stuff that does not seem to have that breath of life, but there's the animate stuff that all seems to have a breath of life, going from very, very small single-cell organisms right the way up through the food chain, I, f I suppose you could call it, to man himself or woman herself, we, we have all got this living structure, this living material um, that seems, and life seems to be able to exit those materials and enter those materials somehow, and man still really hasn't discovered how that occurs. But to me that proves a lot about uh, um, how God uses material. There's obviously material that is inanimate in its nature, uh, it still degrades and it, and it shifts in its form, but there is more animate material in its nature as well that seems to be animated through some kind of pulling together from some kind of structure into a living form. And these living forms, um, we can assume God's form must be greater than all of these living forms placed together and that God herself must also have a living form of some kind. But it has to exist outside of the dimensional spaces that currently exist so therefore it must be of a different type of nature of living form than we are currently able to conceive okay 
Okay, so you don't know what God is made of or what God looks like? No, I'm struggling still and, and uh, to even after 2,000 years of existence and also a lot of, uh, of information in the spirit world, I'm struggling still to understand the different particles that exist in the universe uh, and there are the potential of even more particles yet to be discovered in the universe without discovering the particles that exist outside of the universe that, of which God must be made up of. So that's a whole different another scientific experiment, set of experiments that are way beyond my current emotional and intellectual capacity to understand and grasp. Okay. Mm. So I think it's ready to move on to questions that you're going to answer. No worries. Ask. No Sorry, worries. I had to ask those. It's very important time. to ask those questions yeah. because uh, we can spend a lot of time postulating and, and uh, theorising about things like that when the reality is I feel there are many more important questions to ask and, and the reality too is that if we th spend a lot of time theorising about things that obviously logically are going to be very, very difficult to ask, then it seems to be a fair bit of a waste of our time initially. We need to get firstly onto the questions we can answer and then use those questions that we can answer as a platform to discover the questions that we cannot answer. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So... Um God is love. So is love a substance of God? That's actually part of God? Yes, it's a, it's a substance of God. Uh, so divine love, what I'm calling divine love, is a substance that exists within God. It's, a, it's separate to the universe itself. It does not exist in the universe itself without it being transmitted from God to a soul in the universe. So it can exist in the universe only through transmission from God. Whereas the natural love, which is a different form of love, a different substance again, uh, uh, can be transmitted between you, yourself and myself and, and we do not need to involve God in the transmission of that particular substance. And, and in fact, every single emotion that we actually have is a substance of some kind. And um, it, it therefore makes sense that uh, one of the emotions that transforms our soul, which is God's love, um, must be also a substance. Yes. So when we receive divine love, we're actually receiving a part of God into us. Yes. And that's part of the reason why our soul expands. Exactly. It's, it's a particle. It's obviously a particle that exists from a physical physics perspective, a particle that enters us that has the ability, the way God's designed our soul, has the ability to transform it, has the ability to make it transform into a new creature. Um, it, it's very different from all other substances that can enter our soul because all other substances that come from within our universe that enter our soul, and there are many of those, um, those, many of those cannot transform us into anything beyond what our original nature was created to be. So it's a very, very different type of substance. And, and in fact, my, again, assumption is that God may have other types of substances besides God's love that could potentially enter us as well and transform us in a different direction. And, uh, but I've yet to fully discover those substances. There's a present, I have some assumptions that I've made about some of those substances and I'm experimenting with the ability to, to absorb them. But as yet, I have not personally discovered the other substances that could have the same transforming effect. So what, what do you think they are? Well, one, uh, one that comes to mind immediately is wisdom um, as a substance um, from God. In that, in that if you examine the universe very, very carefully, you can see that um, it is very, very complex in its nature and, and it's full of um, high, highly developed intelligence. And even if we look at our Earth, we can see the intelligence required to design something like a body of any kind, like a physical form of any kind, such as an animal, a dog, a cat, or so, so forth, or a, a human body, uh, uh, huge amounts of intelligence involved in, dis in, in creating such a form. And that being the case, there must be huge amounts of intelligence available inside of God. Now, now, as you receive divine love, your capacity to absorb in intellectual things your, or absorb knowledge grows. And so we have the capacity to understand things intellectually. But the wisdom of how to use them together and to create a framework in which they all operate together without self-destruction and without anarchy, this is an entirely different set of uh, things that constrain the physical universe. And so from my perspective, I see discovery in two different areas really that are important. Firstly, there's the discovery of what the creations are 
themselves. And I'm always fascinated in anything discovering in that direction. But there's also the discovery of the laws that constrain or control the creation or constrain the universe in which we exist. And those laws seem to have a different nature altogether. They're like a framework that exists without a physical form. Uh, but they must have some kind of form, some kind of energetic structure to exist, uh, very much like a law of gravity, for example, is created through mass creating gravity and we have some kind of structure that creates gravity and so we, we know that if we have a small mass then there's a small amount of gravity, if we have a large mass then there's a larger amount of gravity and the, these other laws must also exist in the similar forms that we can at some point measure um, but, but you know there are just so many of those laws, an infinite number it appears of those laws even um, that uh, to me that's another area of fascinating uh, examination so examination of the laws is even more interesting than the examination of the creation that the laws create. And I sort of see it as the creation, then there's the laws that constrain the creation, which if you think of it like a, a layers of an onion, there's the internal layer, which is the creation itself. Then there's the outside layer, which is the laws or the structure that actually control that creation. And we've discovered many of those laws, uh, many of them pertain to love, and we've discovered in the universe many of those laws, but there, I still feel there's many more of those laws to discover. And the more of those laws we discover, we may find that there is another layer that controls the law somehow um, uh, before we even get to the layer that allows us to, to understand God completely. Um, so, you know, these are all just assumptions that we can make based on what's already been discovered and using that as a foundation to go ahead with further discovery. So is, is God's laws, is it, what's the law made of? Is it, is it an intention of God? Or? Well, yes, I, I feel quite strongly that, again, it must be made up of a substance of some kind, uh, some kind of energy uh, or substance. It has to have existed before the universe came into existence. So therefore, it has to be made up of a similar type of substance that God is made up of, if you think about it in some way, or, or a substance closer to the substance that God is made up of. And this is why my real fascination is more with the laws than it is with the physical, um, you know, the physical examination, examination of creation. The physical examination of creation is obviously made up of a completely different substance to what God's made up of, because it existed after God existed, so therefore was created by God. But before those physical substances came into existence, the laws had to have come into existence. So therefore they have to be made up of a different type of substance that the universe that is even present within the universe, although the laws have to be present on the, upon the universe to operate and force the universe to conform to God's intentions or desires. So for that reason, it would, we could then presume that the laws have to be closer to God's nature than the physical creation is. And so that's why my areas of uh, investigation, right from um, short, shortly after I discovered the whole process of receiving divine love, has been focused more upon the laws and God's nature in terms of the feelings that I could feel from God than on the physical investigation of life itself and matter on earth or matter in the physical world. Yeah. So do you think... So divine truth isn't a substance of God? Um, you could say divine truth is more like a, um, it's the best way to describe it would be divine truth is more like a, a constraining force upon the substances. It, it, something is either true or not true. There, there, there is no in between with God. So there's no like, quite often when I was growing up I had different persons say to me that uh, they felt that there, were, there was white and black when it came to answers and then when there was like hundreds of levels of shades of grey and they likened it often to the human eye can see what is it, 1,024 or I forget the total amount of shades of grey that we're capable of measuring with the human eye and they basically likened uh, morality and other issues and also all questions as shades of grey with white and black on either end and my feelings are with God no there is just white or black in the sense of answers you know there is a, a truthful answer or a non-truthful answer while we're discovering the truth there will be shades of grey 
So one of the discussions I would love to have, and we'll do an interview of shortly, will be about the qualities of truth, because it's very important to answer the questions about the qualities of truth before you can really answer other questions. Uh, even questions about God can't really be answered without understanding the qualities of truth. So, so we need to discuss that as a probably different topic at some point, the qualities of truth. But if you examine truth, truth either is or is not. Like it is, there is only two potential options of something being true or not true. We can slowly discover more of it, but eventually we will arrive on any particular subject at it is or it is not one of those two things. Now, that, that, there doesn't have to be a substance for that truth to exist. Do, do you understand? And so for that reason, I feel personally that truth is not a substance as, as love or other emotions are a substance. However, truth is emotional in the sense that um, without understanding love and other emotions, we will never come to an understanding of truth. So when the truth enters our soul, mm -hmm. that's an emotional experience. That's not a substance of God entering us. No, I don't feel it's a... Sub well, often as the truth enters us, the substance of God's love also enters us at the same time. So it's very, very hard to separate the two. Does that make sense? From each other. So while we're receiving uh, divine love, at the same time we're automatically having these amazing realisations of truths that we didn't understand before. And so we can't really divorce the two from the, uh, the truth, divine truth and divine love from each other. But I am sure that divine truth truth is able to exist um, and be discovered without love yet being felt. So, for example, this is very much like a scientist going through an experiment, not feeling anything about the actual end result of the experiment, but discovering that there is such a thing as gravity, as a truth. You know, and then later on, uh, after further experiments, discovering there is this another divine truth, which is the truth of aerodynamics that in an atmosphere we have the possibility of creating a certain shape and therefore uh, creating lift and therefore uh, lifting above the ground if we have enough power. And, and this is another truth, but the scientist, scientist who discover it doesn't, you know, he might go through many emotional experiences doing that that would be based on his desire and passions and so forth, but the truth itself about the, uh, the, the law of gravity or the law of aerodynamics hasn't entered him as, a, as an emotion, it's just entered him as a belief, a trust, that he has that particular thing that he can rely upon. So, so I feel that while truths will enter us after we have processed certain emotions, um, there is the possibility to discover certain truths um, without having gone through an emotional experience. Okay. <clears throat> so um, does God, is God growing in love or...? Because if God is infinite, and then we can all receive God's love, in theory, for an infinite amount of time, mm -hmm. does that mean there's a lot of infinites involved here? Yes, so, of course. <laughs> so does that mean God is... Do you know if God is expanding? Has God had to develop in life? Um, I would have to answer, even though, I, like I said, with the previous constraints of this discussion, mm -hmm. I said that I have not um, been able to discover the substance of God and those kind of things at this point in time. I, I would have to answer to the definite, though, that God is expanding. And the reason why I have to answer that way is that every single thing in the universe that does not grow eventually degrades and changes its condition. And, uh, and, so, and so growth is a law of the universe. Uh, the universe itself grows, uh, it can continually expands, even dimensionally it expands. So, so new dimensions are added to the universe in a fairly consistent manner based on the growth of an individual even. So an individual can grow and actually get to the point that they create through their growth a new dimension and that dimension will grow as new individuals enter that same state and then that first individual or others may grow to a new state and they create even new dimension that's even greater than the one that they've just created and the same process multiplies. And so, so sh seeing all of these things happen over 2,000 years, I have to say that God must be definitely growing. And that would then, you would then have to say that God must be then definitely growing in all sorts of characteristics and traits and attributes, not just in one trait or attribute. So God's love must be growing, but God's wisdom must be growing, God's power must be growing and so forth. Just like 
when I go through the same process of receiving divine love from God, my soul grows and my power grows, my understanding grows, my knowledge grows, my wisdom grows, my, all of these other qualities, my empathy, my compassion, and all these other qualities grow. So um, as we talked about in the soul interview last week, God creates us as whole souls which then split in two. Mm-hmm. And you've drawn God as a whole soul on board. Yes. Talks. Yep. Oh, this is another question which is kind of... <laughs> I'll get these out. No, no, that's fine. Um, this is very good. Um, do you know if God ever was two halves and then formed as one? Um, yes, I can't say for certain whether God was in the past something that happened before the universe itself that I'm a part of existed, obviously. <laughs> yeah. um, we can only make certain presumptions. Some of those presumptions will be more likely than other presumptions. And, uh, but, but it is obvious from the creations, that are the highest creation in the universe, which is the human soul, it is quite obvious that God does have feminine and masculine characteristics and traits. Otherwise, those traits couldn't exist in the universe she or he created. So it does make sense that those traits must exist inside of God. And that is certainly the case. And, and the more and more closer I've become to God, the closer I've become to, to each what I'd call side of God uh, in terms of the masculine and feminine sides of God. Unfortunately, um, the way God is portrayed on earth usually is very masculine in nature. And as a result of that, uh, there is very little femininity, divine femininity portrayed on earth at all. And, uh, and, uh, and I feel that will change in the coming years. Um, but that is something that does need to change so that people can understand God's nature much better than they currently do. So, but, so in answer to the question, yes, I do believe that God does have fem- feminine and masculine qualities and characteristics because I've felt both of such and I've observed them in the creation of the universe. However, I don't know whether that means that God at some point in the future had, had a separated nature just like we did that was growing together through a process. So in other words, I don't know if God had gone through the process we are currently going through, that we have currently or we are currently going through to become God, because I don't know how God became God. No, fair enough. Um, So what are some of the masculine qualities of God versus the feminine qualities? Well, what if we first discuss what are the qualities of God and then we can start allocating them as to masculinity and femininity or otherwise? Um, Because masculinity and femininity is is in itself quite an interesting discussion uh, in terms of what defines masculinity and what defines femininity and so forth. And I feel that that is a very, very separate uh, discussion to what are God's attributes and qualities uh, and then and then maybe we, we need to proceed as to which one of those qualities are feminine or masculine or, or whatever. Does that make sense? So I was thinking perhaps if we rub this off the board now and just um, perhaps start looking at the primary qualities. Now, it's interesting with all of God's qualities that pretty much all of them have what I would call sub-attributes of qualities to them. It's a bit like... You have a thing inside of you called an eye, right? That thing, which, is, uh, has, which can be described in its own form, it has a certain type of shape and a certain type of size. So you could say your eye. What, what could we say about a person's eye? So the eye... It's round. It's round, completely round, isn't it? Like it's got a round shape. So we know everyone's eye is the same pretty much. It's round unless it's been deformed in some way or, it's, or they've lost it, right? It has a, has, has a retina part to see the eye, so it has a retina. These, these are what you would call... How do you spell retina? I know. Um, these are what you would call... So this is the object. So we call that the object. And these are its attributes. And even parts of the eye have attributes of their own. Can you see that? The retina itself has attributes of its own. It has uh, rods and cones, um, some of which determine gradients of light, others of which determine colour, right? But the retina itself doesn't do that. It converts it all into electrical signals. So that's another attribute and quality. So so you can see that with each attribute... So we can can pick an object in the body, for example, the eye. We can then... 
describe its attributes, but inside of each one of those attributes, we could then go and describe another series of attributes of that particular thing, and then it makes sense, of course, that at some point we'll be able to go, OK, let's look at the rods and the cones in the retina of the eye. So we know that there's rods and cones, and I think it's the cones that, uh, that look at the colour and the rods that look at the gradients of light. And, and then we could describe them as, as having sub-attributes and so forth. And you can see, if you really take this down to the infinite in terms of, in terms of miniaturisation, there is the potential that each particular thing we could describe has another whole series of attributes and qualities to that particular thing. Does that make sense? OK, well, let's now apply that theory to God's... Nature. Yes, right. So let's so let's examine God's nature. So let's start let's start with the primary thing we know about God's nature, which is this divine this love. When we start describing love, what do we, what terms do we use? What what qualities do we describe in love? So you might have a part of love is called kindness. But that's not the only part of love. So you could say love is the object, in this case, that we're describing in terms of our analogy here. We're only This is now an analogy. And this is the attribute that describes part of that object. So let's look at kindness. Now, kindness itself could be described <laughs> separately. What other qualities? You, you have compassion. And then that has its own qualities in nature. You have mercy which has its own qualities in nature, and we could keep listing parts of love. All these are a part of love, if you think of it. They're all part of love's attributes and qualities, and uh, they themselves has attributes and qualities of their own, um, every single one of those. And, and if we start analysing what that could describe, we may even go deeper and deeper into each thing, right down even to the actual colours uh, like one thing that mankind hasn't discovered on Earth very much at this point is that each one of these qualities has a colour associated with it and it has a sound associated with it and it has a smell associated with it and it has all these other attributes all associated with these particular emotions. So when you enter the spirit world, you become a bit more sensitive to all of those things. So you actually see the colour. When somebody has a feeling of kindness... You see a colour coming out of the person of a specific type that's a part of love that you see interblended with love, and, but it, you see it as a different type of quality and it has a smell, an odour, like a, a, it's, a, it's a very aromatic uh, odour in the case of kindness and you can smell the odour of kindness. Some, so you can actually smell it on the person and also coming out of the person and you can, you can hear it as well. It has a sound, it has a melody to it, a, a musical song, if you like, and and so forth. It has all of these attributes and qualities that we've even on earth yet to discover about these things. But this is why love feels so good, <laughs> because uh, because when somebody is kind to you, for, for a lot of people, when they first experience kindness, they're overwhelmed with, with grief because they don't realise at that point in time that their soul is not just actually feeling the emotion of kindness, but there's a song of kindness, the, 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 you know, the melody of it, there's the, the, the smell of it and the taste of it and the, the um, colour of it, and everything is being absorbed by the soul at that point. Is this natural love and divine love? Natural love and divine love, yeah, so is similar. But, but obviously, if we're talking about divine love, we're talking about a different colour, different different colours and than natural love. Does that make sense? Yep. So so every single attribute and quality of God, it would also make sense, has its own odour, its own colour, its own and its all substances that can be felt from God. And and are in fact felt from God. So let's if we examine the quality of love. The quality of love, if we're talking now about divine love, it has uh, so this is a love that can only come from God's soul. It can't come from a human soul. Even if you, as a human soul, have it within you, it still cannot come from you. Um, you can't refer God's love onto somebody else, as a lot of people on, uh, who, who are interested in New Age stuff think that they're able to do. Um, it's only the natural love that can do that. You can, only, you can only give your love to somebody else. And, in fact, I can't even give your love to somebody else here, like I can't give your love to Anto, you can only give your love to Anto. Does 
Does that make sense? And it's the same principle with God. Only God can give her love to you. Nobody else can do it for her. There's no mediator in the process. There's no person who's the middleman in the process, which is great when you think about it because you know you're having a personal relationship under those circumstances. So with the divine love, this is the love that comes specifically from God and has the ability, given certain conditions, to enter the human form. And when I say the human form, the soul being the human form, the human soul. And that love has characteristics and attributes of its own, which are very, very different to the characteristics and attributes of what I would call love that is natural love. So natural love has certain characteristics and attributes right, that are different, although sometimes similar in nature, but they're different. They have different colours, different smells, different uh, tastes, different, different um, uh, sounds than what comes from God. Right? And, of course, uh, we have the ability as a human race uh, to, to investigate these matters and see them actually occur as well. Yeah. So um, we've talked about love as a major attribute of God. What are the other kind of core, important one attributes that are kind of should be a priority for us to know? You know? Um, well, I, I feel um, some of those qualities are a part of love. So, so if we try to separate the qualities that are a part of love to the qualities that are actually that are actually uh, love itself. I feel the next, uh, the th there's two more probably of the highest possible qualities that we need to actually absorb from God. So I believe that truth is a quality that can be absorbed from God. And while it, it may not be a substance necessarily, it exists in its own right, there is also the potential of it being a substance that can, you can receive from God. Right? But humility is another quality that uh, we can receive, I believe, from God as well. Um, and When you say receive, you mean come to learn about that attribute within God? No, I you mean actually, actually... Receive. Yeah, actually um, have a part of that quality enter you from God. Does that make sense? So, for example, in our previous discussion of truth, I said that truth can exist without an emotion. But there is the potential, again, of truth inside of God being some kind of emotional thing that happens, that is the, that is the basis of all of God's knowledge. Does that make sense? Like some kind of thing that exists inside of God that is emotional in nature that, that can give us all the knowledge of the universe if we are able to connect to it. And... Humility, I'm not sure whether God has that as a quality myself. Um, I don't know whether God needs that as a quality. I know, for example, what we would define as humility, God certainly has. And when I say that, um, for example, God has made a lot of, uh, you know, obviously very powerful, beautiful things in the universe. One of the things God made was you. In the process, uh, who is also potentially being a powerful and beautiful thing, right? And, and God made you with the ability to actually not listen to God at all. Now, that requires humility to do that, if you think about it. Like, to actually create something that you have all this amazing knowledge enough inside of you to create, and then to allow that thing to, de to demonstrate potential anarchy <laughs> must be... Be, uh, must require of the person creating a large degree of humility, a large ability to let go, a large ability to not control, a large ability to just allow things to happen. But if God is all love, um, that would be natural, would it not? Of course. This is why, do you argue that humility is a part of love or do you argue that it's a separate thing? Now, my feelings are that humility and truth are separate things to love. And the reason why is that a person must first have humility before they can absorb any new truth. And a person must absorb new truth before they can be in a condition of receiving love. So, for example, when you first met me, you had to allow yourself to absorb the potential truth that God exists as an entity. Before then, you thought that God didn't exist at all. And, uh, but you knew there were some questions that you had un unanswered 
but you had to have enough humility to decide that, oh, there are questions that I have not answered, and, oh, I can actually make an experiment where I can attempt to answer those particular experiment, those particular questions. And that requires humility. It also requires a desire for truth. You have to desire truth more than you desire your own ego, your, your own desire for, you know, for self, or your own desire to be... Uh, to be viewed by anybody around you as powerful or, or, or knowledgeable or any of those other things. And so I do believe they are separate qualities. Yeah. There's another quality I feel God has that is a separate quality, um, which is power. And here I'm talking about universal power um, in terms of if you look at everything that's created in the universe from the laws right the way across to the physical things, the entities, Every single entity God has ever created and all of the laws, they all have power inherent in them, right down to even atomic and subatomic levels that we've discovered at this point in time on Earth. They still have power inherent in them. And if you try to pull those bonds apart, you realise how much power you need to actually destroy the power that's in them. So therefore they have power inherent in their connection. So power must be also another quality of, that it's a part of God's nature that is a separate part to love in terms of that, that can exist. Now, when I say a separate part to love, it's probably the wrong way of saying it because my feelings are that nothing can actually exist in God's nature without love being inherent in it. And in fact, everything that I've discovered at this point in time about God has always had love inherent in the quality. And for that reason... Um, I've been able to base all experiments that I've had with God on this aspect of love first, more than anything else. Um, I feel when people try to experiment with God without love being involved, then you're not going to discover very much about God at all because God's primary quality, it appears to me, is love. And therefore, that being the case, it would make sense that every other thing that God has ever had as a part of her nature is also has also love as its underlying basis. So power, for example, is a is a loving quality that God exercises. On earth, there is very, very little love in power. And in fact, most of the time power is exercised very unlovingly here on earth. God only exercises power in a loving manner. With the way God accesses humility. On earth we often see so called humility, which is more what I would case as a deference to others and a, and a, and a um, putting down of oneself. That's not humility. That's not the kind of humility God has. God doesn't put down herself or himself. And it's not... So I don't describe that as a part of that quality. So with regard to truth, there are many things on earth that man thinks is truth, but what I'm talking about here is what is the absolute truth on any one subject. So the absolute truth on any subject, uh, for example, the subject of colour, can be determined to a large degree by looking at what goes on in the majority of people. Now, of course, there are people who are colour blind, which who see different colours. Um, but all of us see the colour uh, or, or, or the sh shade of white or a bright colour like so. We also all see the colour of black. And we can all agree on those particular colours generally, or if we could call them shades, it would probably be a better term. And so therefore there's a truth involved that all of us observe that is consistent across all of us. Now it doesn't mean that an animal sees it the same way. It just means that all of us see it this way and we all interpret it in our brains a certain way. Now as to why a person who is colourblind, which is a genetic problem, uh, can only see a certain thing as a different colour, it's really yet to be discovered as to why on earth, why that's the case. But we know that a person who is colourblind doesn't fit the norm. And we know that the norm is to see certain colours a different, a certain way. And then a person who's colour blind because of some kind of genetic issue passed down through the genes of the, the mother, in this case, um, they see a colour differently. And we know that there must be some kind of genetic mutation that's occurred there that caused them to see something differently. And so we can determine the truth of a lot of things physically through that process of just examining what is the general, general connection. But that is not the best way to de determine divine truth. And the reason why is that um, while there is huge amounts of divine truth present on the earth, um, 
very few people can uh, can feel God's love or feel God's love enter them and so therefore are unable to understand divine truth very easily. So there has to be another process that we have to engage to understand divine truth. And f- for that reason I feel divine truth is a different substance or a different quality to it than truth, absolute truth itself has in the sense that divine truth requires the reception of divine love for it to be completely understood. Uh, whereas... Whereas other truth is just, we can understand it through a process of deduction or experimentation quite easily. Yeah. The same applies with the process of the quality of humility that God has, I feel. Um, if you look at the quality of humility in people, it's often uh, what, what I would feel is self-denigration rather than humility. Um, humility is, it, it involves uh, an aspect of humility, an attribute of humility, is modesty and modesty involves not um, not just seeing yourself as a terrible creation of God but rather seeing yourself as you truly are a wonderful creation of God so you, you can actually be modest and say I am wonderful <laughs> uh, and that is also humble to say such a thing so the quality of humility that people believe humility to be on the earth is often very different to what I see in God and what I've felt from God in terms of God's nature in my interaction with my relationship with God. And the same goes with the quality of power. The quality of power obviously can exist without God um, in, the sense, in the sense that we have personal power, that God has given to us and given us the right, and right, right is probably not the best way to, term to use, he's given us the will to be able to use that personal power in a direction that we decide, in other words, based on our desire. This power comes from within us, um, and we can grow in power in some areas, and and we can reduce in power in other areas. Um, It also makes sense that both of those things are available to God. But again, God's power is never used out of harmony with love. So therefore, God's attribute and quality with regard to power is very different to our own what we see our power in terms of human power is it is very frequently used out of harmony with love. So therefore it must have a different quality or a different attribute than God's. God's power is never used out of harmony with love. The same goes with humility that is a becoming or a part of God's nature. God's humility is never used out of harmony with love. God never self-degrades, never degrades herself in any interaction with any person or individual or other, or any person who she's created in particular. If that's, but we often see people who are so-called humble on earth denigrating themselves um, in order to prove their humility. God doesn't do that. The same applies to truth. If we look at God's truth, God's truth always involves love, divine love, in some aspect of it. And, uh, and yet, and, and this goes from the physical truths that we can discover right the way through to all sorts of very complicated truths emotionally that we can discover and truths about the universe themselves and how it's created, the laws that, that construct the universe and so forth. There are all these, there's all this love in every, inherent in every single one of those qualities. On earth, you can discover truth without love, right? So that tells me that the the nature of truth within the individual is very different to the nature of truth that comes from God, divine truth. So you could say every one of these qualities that I'm now describing about God, you've got divine truth, which is very, very different to human truth. We've got divine humility, which is very, very different in its nature to human humility. And we've got divine power, which is very different in its nature to the way humans exercise power. And... And so this tells me that the nature of God is far more advanced than our own nature because every single quality we look at that is inherent within ourselves, which also must be inherent within God when we examine the universe, we can see the proof of that, is very, very different the way it's displayed. And it's always displayed with the underlying feeling of love throughout in, and inherent in every single of these other qualities that we can discover about God. And that's why I feel discovering God's love is the most important thing. Because once you discover God's love, all these other understandings come to you. So all of these things you learned through receiving of divine love? Yes, yes. 
And so, um, I, you know, once I receive divine love to a certain point, but see, I can have, I can have as a human. So, just a, for example, yourself as a scientist, before you believed in God, so before you had any interaction with God as a scientist, you did have the quality of humility, to a degree. Because you, you decided to investigate something that you didn't know, and it takes humility to do that, to, to, to say, I don't know, I'm going to go ahead and make some mistakes and investigate and experiment. That requires humility. You also had a desire for some kind of truth, didn't you, <laughs> inside of you? Otherwise, you would never have become a scientist, yeah. right? And you would never have discovered, uh, you know, you'd, you'd never have desired any more truth than what your parents had already taught you, that you would have believed is true, even though some of it is not. And so these kind of qualities had to be a part of you, inherent in your nature, before you started even the process of seeing whether divine love actually exists. But as divine love enters you, what I've found is a part of the divinity of all these other things enter you as well. And what that means then is that as God's love enters me, my flavour of humility changes. So while before I was only humble when it came to external matters, as soon as divine, some, some God of God's love enters me, I have become more humble about internal matters, about matters of the heart, you know, how I feel. When I examine the truth, I become more humble about what kind of truth I can examine. Before I would have gone, oh, I can only examine truth about physical matters or physical things that I can scientifically measure. And now, as you have, are learning, you now can experiment and, and measure things that are beyond that, that are different to that, that would not normally be accepted as an acceptable way of discovering truth in a scientific community that you can create scientific experiments and actually discover. And, and so the flavour of truth that you're open to changed. As soon as you discovered this first thing, the flavour of everything changes. And it all starts to change from being what we are personally capable of demonstrating as a quality coming from within ourselves into qualities that we're not personally able to demonstrate without God's love first infusing or coming into our soul and changing it and transforming it in some way. So it's a bit like, like a snowball, like going down a mountain and picking up all these other bits as it goes along. Exactly. And growing and growing. And growing. Yeah. And it's, and it's just a wonderful thing about God's nature is that God's always sharing her nature through this love. So, so, so while I might have to have a few qualities inside of myself before I begin the process, um, once I begin the process of connecting with God, it starts transforming my soul's nature. It starts manipulating its form in terms of expansion, but also transforming its nature into something that wasn't originally created to actually be initially and it's, it's like a, it's now a transformational process of growth is going through where the soul was only originally able to be this big without God and then all of a sudden parts of God's nature start well particularly God's love start entering it and all of a sudden now the soul's got this as larger nature itself and now has a part of God's nature in that particular quality so so you began with humility obviously to be a scientist you had to have some um, but now you have far more humility than you had then. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because part of God's nature has entered you, and in that process you've gone, oh, well, but there's this and there's that and there's this and there's all these other things I could experiment with that I didn't know about before. And, and wow, like, and now you are far more open to more truth as a result of that. Does that make sense? And, and so what's going on inside of the human soul is this ability, as we receive this first part of God's nature, divine love, it has the ability for us to now begin absorbing other parts or characteristics of God's nature become a part of us as well. And I feel that's one amazing thing about God. It's incredibly um, <clears throat> generous. <laughs> exactly, exactly, which is, a, which is another quality of divine love, generosity. General, general. <laughs> generosity is another part of love and and any in fact any person who receives a part of god's nature with regard to love will become automatically more generous they'll become more generous with their time they'll become more generous with their knowledge they won't require a cost associated with their knowledge they will never charge for their knowledge and so forth automatically that's a part of god's nature 
God doesn't do that, and neither does any person who's become more godlike. So, so when a religion charges for something, or when a you know a, a business charges for something, that tells you that they're yet to absorb part of divine love with regard to the way they operate. Because if they had of, they could no longer do such a thing. And there, yeah, what I like about that is there is a way to measure whether a person has actually become more divine in their nature by, by, by seeing whether they've become more like God in their nature and the way God operates with, with us. Yeah. So it's, it's a barometer for ourselves as well. It is a barometer for ourselves. It's a barometer for our own progression. If we still, for example, if we still give our time wanting something in return, then we know we've yet to receive a part of God's divine love that would cause us to stop doing that. A person who's received divine love to a certain degree would never do that anymore. Right? If I have tried to constrain you in some way, if I try to constrain you in some way that's not loving to the environment or based on some kind of emotion of anger or frustration that I have with you, then I know I haven't received divine love. Because if I had of, I would have God's nature on that matter. What does God do with you? God doesn't punish you or try to constrain you just when you try to do something that is out of harmony with God. God has laws that correct you, so I would attempt to correct you still, but I wouldn't not love you anymore. I wouldn't be angry with you anymore. Could God? So that tells me that if, if, if you did something that, that I viewed as wrong and I was angry with you as a result, now I obviously have some work to do with God's nature because I've yet to receive God's nature properly. If I'm, if I'm fully at one with God, I would never be angry with you, no matter what you chose to do. Even if you chose to kill me, I'd still not be angry with you. <laughs> Does that make sense? And that would tell me that I have now received a lot of God's nature to the point where I'm now at one or the same way of feeling on that particular matter as God is. Yeah. So... Um with the other attributes, there's obviously there's um, there's intelligence, there's like logical reasoning. So let's look wisdom. at it. Yeah. So let's call it. Should we call that intelligence then? Yeah. Yep. Wisdom. Wisdom. Uh, you could dis wisdom is different to intelligence in that in that we can be very intelligent and have no wisdom at all. Wisdom is the way we apply intelligence. It's the way intelligence is used. And uh, God certainly obviously has that to, to an infinite amount, considering how he's built our bodies and our souls and our interaction with every single thing. There's a huge amounts of wisdom in, in, inside of those, inside of the creation of God's intelligence. So I feel they are separate qualities of God, yes. And um, so just, just it seems to work that the more here. you grow in love, these, all thing, these things, I mean... You grow in these attributes as well, regardless of whether they were getting them from God, but they just seem to be like the, the higher you are in love, the more wise and more humble you are. And, and the and more intelligent you become. And it's not just because you're getting the attributes from God, it's an expression of the love. Well, what, what happens inside of ourselves as we receive the divine love is it transforms the way all of our natural qualities and attributes, because we can have all of these qualities and attributes naturally ourselves in, inside of our soul occurring without having any connection with God. As I said you know, before I met you, you had the quality of desire for truth and desire for humility already within your soul, otherwise you could never have taken on the the job of being a scientist would never have been available to you if you didn't have some of those qualities, right? And so, and also intelligent obviously had to be there. You had to intellectually understand what you were examining and so there has to be some level of intelligence available to you to even do that. Um, and so obviously some of those qualities existed but as divine love enters you, these qualities change in their flavour. They change in the way in which you express them and they also expand in their ability to be utilised and also understood. And so, yes, you now have a larger, far larger degree of wisdom, for example, as you receive divine love, because, because before you would have been very much, uh, like many scientists, you very much, when I, and when I first met you, very much sort of intellectually examining everything, very little connection with your own emotion, very little what I would have called emotional intelligence. 
um, you, you didn't really understand yourself very well in terms of what was going on in your life, uh, in terms of you know your relationships and and all those kind of things. Your work life was fine, but all the other bits <laughs> were difficult, right? And and so um, and so obviously there wasn't much emotional intelligence there at the time. But but then as you receive divine love, all of a sudden you start growing this emotional intelligence. You start seeing, oh, I can feel that from this person. That's different to what they're telling me. You know, I'm feeling this. Ah. Oh, if I act upon what they're telling me, I'll get myself in trouble. If I act on what I'm feeling from them, now I'll, I'll be in far more harmony with, you know, I won't have as much trouble in my life. And, and so as we, as we work our way through and receive some more of this love from God, we find ourselves expanding in all of these other ways in terms of we're becoming more like God in other ways. That's what it really appears like. So, so we receive, so here's our soul, our half of the soul. We receive some divine love and now all of a sudden we're more truthful, we're more humble, we have a bit more power to exercise, we have more intelligence and we have more wisdom. Like, this is what I said in the first century, all these other things will be added to you. And most people when they read that, they, 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 you know, they, they don't really understand completely what that means. What I'm saying is all these other qualities that we often try to develop singularly or separately can be added to you as you receive this love. And this is the amazing thing about the love is the love has a power of its own that seems to manipulate all other qualities. And that in itself is an amazing fact if we examine that. So what we're basically saying is if, if I want to grow any quality inside of my own personal nature, the fastest way for, for, for that to grow is by my receiving and acting upon the, the love that I receive from God. And if I do that, then all of these other things will grow automatically as well. And uh, I have the ability to expand. The love sort of is like the, the food of expansion in all these other areas as well. So while these are different qualities of God, as I said, every single one of these qualities in God has God's love as a part of the quality. And so as you grow, you can actually get to know God by seeing how you change yourself. Exactly. And so that's how you discovered it all. Exactly. Cool. That's the experiment. Yeah. The, the real experiment is not the experiments that we can do externally. The real experiment is the experiment that we do with our soul. And if we engage that experiment with God, we can, we can receive this divine love and then measure our own condition over a period of time in different areas, like our humility, our power, intelligent wisdom. We could start writing down, couldn't we, hundreds and hundreds of different qualities that we'd like to develop within ourselves, kindness, compassion, mercy, generosity, all these other love-based qualities, intelligence, understanding, knowledge, all these intellectual-based qualities. We can write power, desire, passion, all those things that are involved in power. We could write down all of those qualities and then we could experiment. We could say, right, let's take a photograph of us emotionally. Let's write down today how we are with all those particular things. And then in a year's time after we've experimented with receiving divine love, let's take another photograph emotionally by writing down all of how we feel about these same things now and have we noticed change. Now, if we haven't noticed change, what I'm saying is you've not received divine love. If you've noticed change in a positive direction, then you've definitely received some. If you've been longing for it, you've definitely received some. Now, it is possible for a person to change without receiving divine love, but what happens with divine love is the change is far more rapid. So I've seen people in the spirit world like change on an issue of generosity over a thousand years. You know, where a thousand years ago they weren't very generous at all, and now a thousand years later they now learn to be generous, right? But, but I've seen a person change who received divine love in, in two minutes between those two conditions uh, in terms of earth time. So that tells me that the power of receiving divine love on the soul has far more expression than if I try to develop the quality of myself without love, without God's love involved. Yeah. So it's passion and desire, they are within us, but they, they are also can come from the attributes of God as well and they can also grow as well? Definitely. So if you think of power, inside of power there are different qualities of power. Passion is one of the qualities of power. Desire is one of the qualities of power and so forth. There are others of course which we can list but if we look at those particular qualities, as I receive divine love these grow. 
So, so my passion for the universe grows. My desires for, for things that are in harmony with love grow. The desire for things out of harmony with love shrinks automatically as well. So, you know, before I might have desired to harm people, now I don't anymore because my desire out of harmony with love shrinks. And so, therefore, how I use my power comes more and more into harmony with how God expresses hers, her power. And this is what happens with every quality. So you can, you can list all sorts of qualities that God has. They all have sub-attributes, right? Then as we receive divine love, we'll notice these things changing in us and they become more godlike in their expression or more loving in their expression automatically, not something we try to do. You know, It's not like I have to educate myself. Oh, I've got to remember to be more loving. It's not like that at all. It's automatic. So, so when we've got to say, oh, I've got to be more loving here, oh, I've got to be, oh, no, it's best for me to work out how to be more loving here, when we're not understanding, right? Because the reality is as we receive divine love, we don't have to work it out anymore. It's automatic. Passion is automatic. Desire is automatic. Desire in harmony with love is more automatic. And desire in, harmony with, uh, in disharmony with love becomes less automatic um, to the point where it can't even exist at all. I can't even do anything out of harmony with love once I become at one with God. I can't. It's impossible to do anything with it. It's physically impossible for me to do it. And, and this is the beauty of receiving love as the primary connection with God, is that as we receive love, then all of these other qualities all develop and become more harmonious with that divine, with divinity. They be not, so they're no longer in harmony with how I would do it. They're now in harmony with how God does it. Yeah. Um, so all of these things are expressed in the universe mm -hmm. through God's creation. Are Ooh. there any that yep. up until now or have been absent on earth that you feel like that are obvious in the spirit world or in high dimensions that if the earth improves, improves their soul condition that will become more apparent? Yes, I don't, I don't know if it could be said, Luli, that there's any quality of God that is absent anywhere in the universe. Because I, the, the more and more I discover of the universe myself and the more I discover in terms of receiving divine love, the more I see God's nature inherent everywhere. Like I've visited the hells of the spirit world. The, in the first dimension, there are very, very, uh, air, very dark areas in the spirit world where people who are who what most people on earth would classify as very evil exist. Um, and even when I visit those locations... I see God's love inherent in the location itself and the way in which God's treating that particular person. And so, you know, there is, there is a substance of God's love everywhere, even in the most darkest places of the universe. So um, what I feel is a part, uh, is, can, be, can be assumed from that, is that, is that all of God's qualities are able to be received in any location in the universe. But there are some locations that it's more difficult to receive it in than others, but it is still present at, in some form in those locations. I haven't, and in fact, I sort of, the way I currently believe, and I feel this is a great basic divine truth as well, is that if there was such a thing as a complete absence of any or all of God's qualities in a location, then that particular location could no longer exist. Does that make sense? Within the universe. Within the universe. So in other words, it's a physical impossibility for our location to have none of God's qualities existing in it. Mm. Right, okay. Um, I feel like I want you to just talk loads more about that. <laughs> I don't know what the but question. what's the subject about <laughs> well, no, God's but, attributes? No, it's about, it's about God's attributes and qualities. Yeah. I feel that yeah. there's a whole lot. Could you tell me some more of the attributes that aren't there or... Well, as I said, every attribute and quality sort of has all these sub-attributes and qualities. So, so when I list the attribute of love, for example, we could probably list lots and lots of different qualities that are sub-attributes of love and then describe every single one of those qualities in terms of how God exercises them. And we could do the same with truth, divine truth. We could do the same with humility. We could do the same with God's power and intelligence and wisdom and so forth, I feel. that I feel the main thing, though... Uh, for most people to get from this discussion is we have the ability to go through this experimentation process ourselves 
We don't have to rely on Jesus or some other person telling us what God is like. We can actually discover a lot of what God is like for ourselves. We can go through the process ourselves of discovering what God is like. And so if you think about it, the actual experiment itself of receiving divine love into our own soul becomes the more important thing perhaps to discuss than anything else. And because that's what establishes the personal relationship. That's what allows us to eventually see God's attributes and qualities. So, so we can have a discussion where, where Jesus lists all of the attributes and qualities of God. And we go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That's another interesting attribute quality. And we can examine it all from an intellectual perspective, never experiencing the quality, so never actually feeling that quality inside of ourselves, never actually displaying it ourselves because we have yet to feel it ourselves from God and, and therefore it's yet to enter us, and never actually understanding anything about the universe. <laughs> so we can go through the entire discussion of God's attributes and qualities without understanding a single thing, really, from an emotional perspective or from an experiential perspective, from our personal experience. Once we receive divine love into the soul, our soul, now we're going through an experience. The beauty of going through the experience is now when we talk about kindness, God's kindness, and we actually go through an experience where we felt God's kindness, now we can feel the attribute of God. And also we will now, because it's now inside of us, be able to start reflecting that attribute of God to other people who are around us, reflecting their kindness, if you like, to, to another person. And, and so what this does is it allows us to experience God through this connection or this relationship. So this thing going on is what I call the relationship. It's a, it's a real relationship that we're developing with God. And through the relationship, we're, we're going through this wonderful process of discovering ourselves, discovering our potential, not, not just what we are now, but our future potential, and also discovering um, God herself through the process as well, because we're, we're, we're receiving part of God's attributes and qualities as we change. And, and then when... We, we talk to another individual about God, we don't have to say, oh, do you think God's like this or do you think God's like that? Because we already know. We've already felt it and we've already experienced it and we've already experienced a change in our own life in the way that we've demonstrated that, that reflection of that love to others. And so, of course, we, we, we can just go, wow, this is like, we know now that God has this quality of power. We also know how God delivers power. To the, to the universe because I've actually personally experienced it and that's how I deliver my power to the universe as well. That's, you know, once I've personally experienced it from God and I've experienced that change me, I now deliver my power to the universe in the same way God delivers her power to the universe. And as I go through that personal experiment, I am now able, without any person's assistance, to say, I know what God's nature and quality is with this attribute of power, for example. Yep. So um, I do want to, of course, talk about God's attributes and qualities, but I feel even more importantly that we need to experience them rather than talk about them. And, and in fact, we can talk about them for a long period of time without experiencing them. And that is a sad thing, I feel, that much of humankind, if you look at almost all of the religions on this planet, they've talked about God, you could literally say until they're blue in the face, and literally for many of them until they've died, they've talked about God, without actually feeling any part of God in their nature. So in other words, by the time of their death, they are still wanting to kill people for example. They still want to impose their will upon other people. They still want to conquer. They still want to do all sorts of other things, right, which are obviously completely against the very nature of God that they've been discussing their entire life. And so I, I do feel that there is a danger in a discussion such as this. And the danger is discussing all of this intellectual knowledge without feeling any of it. And if we discuss it all without feeling any of it, it does not have any power. It doesn't change our life. It doesn't change other people's lives either as a result. If we discuss it and then experiment and feel it, now we have the ability to change other people's lives 
Now we have the ability to change completely. So, so I feel that it's very, very important when any person discusses God's nature and qualities and attributes that they discuss it from a point of view of attempting to experience those qualities, like the, feel them, to actually feel them enter themselves, rather than just discussing the qualities as a pure um, physio... What do they call it? As, um, um, psychological or... or um, philosophical discussion. You know, we don't want to discuss God's great nature and qualities like that. Because if we do that, we will end up dead in our life at some point in the future and still have not changed one single bit from, a, from that discussion. And, and therefore the world around us won't have changed through our existence here, being here either in a positive direction. If we allow ourselves to get away from the philosophy and, in, and the psychology and into the experience, now we have the ability firstly to transform our own self through receive, the reception of divine love. But as we receive divine love, all of a sudden our nature and qualities, like our humility, our truth, our power, our intelligence, our wisdom, our love has now been all infused with these attributes that come from the divine. And so now we have the ability to reflect this divinity on earth and change the earth around us, change people around us through our interactions with them. Now that means that it has power in our life then. So it's pointless having an intellectual discussion without the power ever being experienced. Yep. So that, that being said, if we discuss some of the qualities of God, and maybe we will discuss them in the future more, in more detail, we need to get to experience them before the discussion will benefit us in any way. And if you think about your own experience over the last few years since you've known me, how long has it been now? It's been a couple of years, hasn't Almost it? Almost four. Almost four. So uh, time goes fast when you're yes. having fun, doesn't it? <laughs> or not having not so much no. fun, <laughs> depending on the emotions that come up. Um, but um, if, you, if you think about it, um, when you first met me, your life was very... Um, if you, if you think about the experience of your life, you, you found the, the relationship issues in your life fairly um, consistent. They, they didn't change very much, right? They're sort of a consistent sort of thing is happening. Since in the last four years, if you notice, since meeting me, unfortunately sometimes, <laughs> you've had huge changes in your life. And, and that's what happens when you start receiving divine love too, is that, is that change, you feel motivated to change rapidly you, you can't you're not content with staying still anymore you're not content with absorbing the environment's desires upon you and staying constrained by the environment you you want to expand and so you're now not you you want to grow you want to change you, you, there are all these desires enter you that you maybe didn't have before or didn't know how to exercise before and that's the other beauty of this relationship is that you have the ability to expand and grow through the relationship as well. And so I feel uh, one of God's qualities is actually, if we listed, started listing some of God's qualities, and here we're talking about the primary qualities, not the attributes of those qualities. Another part of God's qualities, which is probably through all of it, is change. Change is a part of God. So that tells me God must be changing, but it also tells me that if I want to get close to God, I've got to continuously change. I've got to always grow, always change. So growth or change is important. What other qualities do you feel there might be, Lily? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Can you see when I ask that question, we can sort of use our intellect a bit, can't we? And we can go, OK, what, what qualities are inside of me? Which obviously God must have, because if God, if if they got inside of me somehow, they had to come from somewhere. <laughs> right. So I was going to ask about personality and and humour. Okay, personality. Yeah. And I guess the logic and reason comes under intelligence and, and wisdom. Personnel. Is it the eyes in the wrong place? Yeah. And a part of personality is things like humour. Yeah so forth. That's an attribute of personality. Yep. But, um, so you were saying at the Soul interview last week that we're all given a, a part of God's personality. 
am a unique part of God's personality. So this is, this is one of the things that I feel has definitely occurred in that there's a, there's God, the way I feel at the moment is that God has an infinite as, number of aspects to her personality. And then what God has done in our creation of us as individuals is God has created us with a specific aspect of God's personality that isn't inherent in every in any other being that God has created, any other soul, God, you know, human soul that God has created. And so the only way I can discover this particular aspect of God's personality is by actually interacting with the person who hasn't. Does that make sense? Yes. And this is a part, this is how God has involved us in the process of discovery of herself, but also involved us in the process of discovery of ourselves. So once we engage that particular aspect of our nature or personality to, to the, in an active manner, that's the time we're going to grow the fastest towards our pure creation, towards what God created us to be. Mm. So if humour is a part of personality and... There's God... somebody on earth who has the best sense of humour or in, in spirit the, work, in the universe. In the universe. Oh, I was going to say that God <laughs> must just find everything funny. He does. Because everybody's senses of humour are so different. Exactly. So God must be constantly amused. Of course. Yeah, wouldn't you be? I don't know. <laughs> well, if you, were, if you were looking at all of it, you'd be, you'd be constantly happy, wouldn't you, as well, and oh, joyful in, in all of your interactions. <laughs> and you'd be constantly amused. Some things would just strike you as very, very funny. And, and sometimes, the, you remember in humour, we have different aspects and qualities to humour, like irony is one type of aspect or quality of humour. So sometimes God finds things very ironic, you know, when he, she, he observes things happening on earth that occur in, or in the spirit world in a certain way. There is a lot of irony in that, you know. And, and there is a lot of those kind of qualities. So all the aspects of humour... If you examine them on earth, that you could examine them potentially. There are some. Now, of course, there are aspects of humour that are on earth that don't exist in God. Those aspects are the aspects that we've developed ourselves, which are, due, which are out of harmony or in disharmony with love. So, for example, there, there's an aspect of humour you could call um, um, sarcasm. That isn't a part of God's nature. Because it's based on anger. Because it's based on anger and pulling a person down and making the person feel small and a lot of other unloving characteristics. And so sarcasm is not a part of God's nature. And so once we become at one with God, sarcasm will not be a part of our own nature. Does that make sense? But there are other aspects of humour which, which will remain. So every single quality that we potentially have as we receive divine love will become purified in its nature and totally in harmony with God's love. So all of these other aspects that you've listed, mm -hmm. um, as you say, can enter us and change us. But personality is different, right? Because our personalities don't change when we grow in love, do they? Um, do they? Yeah, how do they not? Um, I feel they do grow. Um, they certainly grow. So they, so they change in the sense of growing in terms of the way they're expressed. So, um, for, for example, when I, when I was full of very sad emotions, obviously my sense of humour was not very present, right? And my sense of humour might have been based around, you know, sarcasm and rage, you know, at the system or at the world or at particular individuals. Once I've received divine love, then my humour grows and changes. The, the personality trait, or the way I express my humour, changes so the sarcasm d is destroyed or the, the, the parts that are out of harmony with love get destroyed and the parts that are in harmony with love become a part of my nature. Once I become at one with God, I'm still in a process of continual change. I have now discovered my nature but not discovered how big it can be. So it's still going to grow, still going to change. The way in which I express my personality is going to change and my personality will become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as a part of this growth and change. I also have the ability, if you think about it, using my intelligence, I have the ability to select the certain characteristics within myself that I do have and to grow that specifically if I desire to. So I do have the ability to select certain attributes and qualities that I have and to personally take, put an effort into those particular attributes and qualities. Yep. Okay. Mm. Um, Sticking on to the power bit of mm -hmm. God, um, mm -hmm. so that power is inherent within God, mm -hmm. 
And that power created the whole universe mm -hmm. and sustains the whole universe. Even bigger than that. Remember I said to you earlier that the universe itself is made up of certain substances. Certain, certain particles make up the physical universe that are different particles make up the, the other dimensions in the, in the universe. So if we call the physical universe a combination of dimensions, there are certain particles that make up the physical universe that, that, are, that are separate to particles that make up the spiritual universes and then separate to the, the particles that make up the soul universes that have been discovered at this point that, that are more based on the soul. Now, if, you, if we then assume that, that, there, that there are separate layer of particles above that that make up the laws, and then there's a separate layer of particles that make up God, right? Now, if we examine it from that perspective, you know, in that onion layer type perspective, when we see that power, you've got the universal power, which is the physical, which is power being expressed in a physical manner, right? And that's like the power of the sun, the power of, you know, our earth and what it can generate, you know, the power of the moon and what it can do to the earth. And that's the physical power available to the physical elements, the power of an atom, what that can display. So if you look at the power of an atom, it can display some pretty amazing things, pretty right? Powerful. Pretty powerful. So these are all physical things that are powerful, right? Then if we put the other layer around, there's also the spiritual, what you classify as spiritual things, or let's call them physical things in other dimensions is, is a, probably a better term for them. So they obviously have different types of particles that make up those particular elements that make up the spiritual existences and there is different layers of power in that existence. Then you've got the, the laws that constrain, so those two things added together, the physical and the spiritual, are like the universe. But then there are the laws that make up and constrain those particular universes have to be more powerful than the universes themselves. So now we have another layer of power beyond, below God still, since so God created these laws. So there's another layer of power um, that, that, that constrain the universe and constrain everything in the universe, that control it, that keep it uh, so that it doesn't fall into anarchy. And the laws themselves have to, have to be greater in power than the actual physical universe or the actual spiritual universe. Now, of course, each universe, type of universe, has its own set of laws. So the physical laws has, so the physical universe has physical laws. And obviously the laws that constrain the physical universe have to be greater than the physical universe itself. And the laws that constrain, constrain the spiritual universe have to be greater than the physical and spiritual universe themselves. Because the spiritual universe is more powerful than the physical then it would make sense that the laws that constrain them must also be more powerful. So the laws are like this binding thing. And now if we look at what's above that, let's rub out the law layer, and we go back to just this, well, let's redo the diagram a bit better. So we've, so we've got the physical universe, so that's the physical. We've got the spiritual universe, the spiritual universe, uh, let's call them SP. We've got the soul-based universes that have been now discovered. And the laws must still control all that. Right? So th this tells me um, a lot, firstly, about God and the way God uses power. But it also tells me a lot about uh, power itself and, uh, and the qualities of power. Power has priority systems. Power can be used in different priority systems. There are, there are levels of power available. There are levels of power that, of what controls the physical. There are levels of power of what control the spiritual or the, or the other physical spaces, dimensional spaces. There are levels of power what control the soul. And these powerful laws have to be more powerful than, than the, the laws that control the smaller layer, if you like. And, and so this tells me a lot about power and the way God displays power. God displays power in different gradients and degrees based on what kind of universe or what kind of thing is being controlled by the power. And God's highest creation that we've discovered at the moment is the human soul. And the laws that constrain the human soul are far more powerful than the laws that constrain the physical universe and our spirit body and our physical body. And so that tells me a lot about God too, about how God's created this prioritised system with regard to laws, this hierarchy, if you like, of law. 
and uh, and that tells me how God also is powerful. God has a hierarchy of power as well, that it's a part of the characteristics of power. And the power of the greater things, for instance, the soul, is going to be much power than the physical thing, for instance, your body. So actually, your entire body is going to be, cre- be controlled not by you using your mind, which is a part of the spirit existence, but by you using your soul, which is part of the soul existence. This tells me that the way you exercise power, if it's based upon the soul, in other words, based upon feelings, emotions, desires, passions and longings and those kind of parts of the soul, it's going to be far more powerful than it's based upon your intellect. So you can discover lots of different things about how to use power when you see how God's designed power in the universe. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. And the same could be said with intelligence, wisdom and a lot of other qualities. There's these layers, that, or hierarchy of layers, you could say, um, some of which are more important than others and some of which are worthy of focusing our attention. So, so for example, if I focus my intention, my attention, in terms of discovery, just upon the physical, I am focusing my attention upon the least powerful, Can you see that from a power perspective? If I'm focusing my attention on my soul, I'm at least gone two orders of power in terms of in terms of what I'm capacity. I have the capacity to change, and if I focus upon the laws that govern my soul, I've gone an even further step in terms of uh, examining the way the universe works and examining what God must have created, and therefore what must exist inside of God as as in terms of her nature. So, so when I look at it from that perspective, I go, okay, my effort, the best way to use my effort, my personal effort, is not physically. The best way to use my effort is to, is to engage the physical, spiritual, upon the soul and upon the laws and upon my connection with God. That's the best way to use my effort. So once I, once I do that, I start understand when I, when I understand how God's power is created then I can start going, well, where's the best place to put my effort? <laughs> you know, Obviously, if I want to focus my effort on the physical only, which is what a lot of people do, they just focus their effort on the physical life. And virtually if everybody. Virtually everybody, yeah. Yeah, until they pass. They focus their effort on the physical life. And even after they pass, they still often try to focus their effort on their physical life. I know still. Um, you can see that I'm, I'm, I've now taken away the ability the ability of my spirit life and these these far more powerful aspects of my life i've taken i've taken i've created an inability in myself to actually absorb any truths from that from those areas of my life which which is it's like it's like creating a beautiful person scarring them all up and chaining them and that's what i'm doing to myself you know by doing that i'm constraining myself so markedly to to be beyond recognition, almost, if I do that, if I if if I allow myself through this inter- relationship to discover how God uses power, I can then discover a lot about the laws of the universe and the power in the laws of the universe, and I can focus on the laws that have the most power associated with them, and the law, the one law that has the most power associated with it is the law of divine love, the the law that constrains the usage of love in the universe. God's love, not my own. That has the greatest effect. And so therefore, anything that I learn about the law of divine love should be my highest priority because it's going to have the largest effect on my soul, the largest effect on the souls around me, therefore the largest effect on my physical environment and the largest effect on my spiritual environment. Mm. So when I see people focusing their attention on the metaphysical, you know, the spiritual environment, you know, and uh, you know, you see a lot of New Age people and and people in religion focusing their intentions primarily on the metaphysical, what what they think might exist in the in the realms beyond the physical, and I, and I, why are you focusing your attention on that? That that is the second layer. It's the 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 laws of love are the highest layer you could you could ever focus your attention on. Focus your attention on there, and you'll discover all the rest automatically as a part of the process. And one one of the other so one of the other things that I um, feel is a part of God's nature is this: the quality of simplicity. That's why there's Razor's theorem, you know. 
whatever is the most simple explanation is probably the truth. Um, and that is uh, that is why, because God, as an inherent in part of her, her nature, is this desire for simplicity. If if we're humble enough to accept the simple, we can often discover the very most powerful things in the universe as a result. If we if we want to, if we're constantly attracted to the complex, you know. So in other words, what's the opposite of simple? Is complex. We're constantly attracted to the complex. We're not going to discover much of the universe at all. And there are people who are so addicted to their own intelligence that they, they want to only examine the complex and they can't even conceive of examining the simple. And yet examining the simple, they would far exceed their current abilities to examine the complex. So I feel this is all part of God's beautiful nature being demonstrated through all of these things occurring. Yeah. And it's very loving, obviously, to make it possible, therefore, for everybody to learn about the universe. Yes, and that's why I said, like, if you become like a child... A child loves the simple in terms of understanding, you know. So, so if we focus on the simple, the simple things, I'm not saying that there won't be very complex things in the universe to understand. I'm saying if we focus on the simple thing, which is divine love entering our soul, that's very, very simple to understand. A two-year-old child can understand it. Anybody can do it. And so we focus on that simple thing. All these other things, all this other complexity, all this other knowledge, all this other understanding, all this other love, all this other truth, all these other qualities that are a part of God all become a part of myself. And so my nature changes automatically. If I focus on the complex, I won't understand anything about the universe in the long run. And that's why in the long run, the people who are still focused on the complex have stagnated in their progression in the sixth dimension of the spirit world. They cannot progress beyond that point because they because they don't understand one of God's qualities, simplicity. Just one quality that is not understood can stagnate an entire life. One quality of God that we don't understand can stagnate our life for as long as we choose to stagnate our life. Yeah. And that's a scary thought in a way because we could ignore one quality of God and that one quality of God could be the only reason why we're not progressing. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, the way that God gives us love is through the Holy Spirit. Is that... What is that? Um, well, the Holy Spirit is... Um, it's, if you describe it this way, if you see, see here, here's God with masculine and feminine qualities, and here's our soul, the half of the soul, if we think of it from that point of view. Love has to flow somehow between the two things. So remember I said that this love was a substance. So you can think of love like water. Right? And, and often, you know, certain books like the Bible portray love as water. If you think of love like water, water is a substance that flows. And you've got a pipe that it has to flow through. It's constrained by the pipe. Well, the pipe that love throws through from God is called the Holy Spirit. It's pretty flexible. Um, <laughs> moves everywhere it's connected to it's flexible in terms of location and its ability to connect it's not flexible with regard to truth right. totally inflexible in other words if we're out of harmony with truth at any one point in time and at, or out of harmony with how we connect with the holy spirit it's impossible to connect to it impossible the only way to connect to the and and many people on earth believe they're connecting to the holy spirit when they're just connecting to a person on the spirit world in another connection. So I would say, you know, if we could say, here's, here's, here's myself, my half of the soul, and here's Luli, the person I'm now speaking with, right? We can also have a connection and things can flow between us. I would call that spirit. In other words, our natural, it's a pipe, again, and it is a physical pipe that you can see in the spirit world that flows between two people who are interacting in any, in any way. So if we're interacting and we're interacting primarily on an intellectual level, that pipe will be a certain colour, a certain nature. It's green, a dark greenish type of tinge. If we're, if, we're, if we're interacting with each other, the pipe will go into a, in a truthful manner, it'll go into a blue, a nice sort of a sky, dark, bit darker blue than a sky blue in between each other and we'll be able to interact with each other and you'll see this colour, this attribute if you like which is the spirit of the connection and, and it's like a pipe you see it as a cord in the spirit world like, that connects, it's like an electrical cable 
that plugs. So the Holy Spirit is an electrical cable, and the way we can think of it is an electrical cable that plugs from God into the soul of any one of the human souls, the highest of God's creations, as long as the conditions favourable for the connection can be maintained. And the condition, the primary condition favourable for the connection is truth, divine truth, not our own. That's the primary condition. The other secondary condition is humility, a willingness for us to actually deal with any emotion that comes up in us as a result of the connection. Those two things have to be maintained and the holy connection with the Holy Spirit can be maintained. If, if those two things are not present, the Holy Spirit cannot connect, therefore love cannot flow. And it's quite simple and, and a child can understand. If I'm not humble and I'm not in harmony with God's truth and I'm not going to be able to have this connection with God where love can flow between me and God. But if I am humble and I have a connection with God's truth, now something can flow between me and God. And it's very, very similar between us. If, if I have an openness to receiving whatever it is you wish to give and you have an openness to receiving whatever I wish to give and I have a desire to give and you have a desire to give, so those four particular things must exist, then something can flow between us, whatever that is. Intellectual knowledge, it might be, if we're talking about something intellectual. It could be something to do with wisdom that can flow between us. It could be something to do with our personality. We could be having a laugh about a certain subject and that can flow between us. There'll be some connection. So those four conditions must exist. So if we look at it from the perspective of God, with our relationship with God, we've got the four conditions that must exist. I have to have a desire let's pull me as the human I have to desire there has to be a desire that exists from, in me coming from me towards God right? there has to be a desire in God to receive it Right? So God has to want to receive my desire and, 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 and do something with that, to at least receive it, not, not even trying to do it. Three, there has to be a desire from God towards myself. And fourth, there has to be a desire in me to, re to receive that, like, to, to actually to actually get that from God. So if you look at all those th things, that tells us a lot about God too. It tells us that the way God has created every interaction between us as individuals is that for you and I to have a connection, there has to be something in you that wants something from me, something in you that also wants to give something to me, something in me that wants something from you, and something in me that wants to give something to you, and if that happens, we'll have quite a pure connection and a long-standing connection on any particular matter, generally. Those same conditions exist between myself and God. Does that make sense? And if that's the case, then that tells me a lot about God. That tells me things that God has a desire for me uh, that I just need to recognise. And God has a desire to give me things that I just need to accept. I need to be open to accept. And, uh, and this tells me that God wants, one of, one of God's qualities is God wants a relationship. God wants a relationship with every person. So um, what effect... Oh, I've got so many questions. Well, <laughs> same time. Um, um, yep, go, go on. Go on. Oh, what I was thinking of is uh, if there's a lot of questions, what we can do is try to put them in sort of under certain headings perhaps. Mm. Um and and then and even if you just ream off the questions one by one while you're thinking of them, then we've got a record of them, and then we can well, go we've through them. Well, we've got them written down. Oh, okay. Some of them yep. here are, some of them aren't. No, there is. Um, what effect does it have on God when we project love at God? Um, an amazing effect on God, of course. Like, how, what effect does it have on you when somebody loves you? That's a varied response. <laughs> <laughs> That's a varied response. Depends whether you wanted their love exactly. in the first place. Well, let's assume God wants your love. Yeah. Uh, what, so what do you feel God would feel then? Well, 
So you, oh, you see, you see, one thing that a lot of people on earth don't understand, and a lot of people in the spirit world don't grasp either, is this: God has given you the ability to to not give something to God, right? Because God gave you free will. God gave you the, the, your own will to exercise how you see fit. Under those circumstances, you can see that God gave you the ability to not love God. In fact, the only thing that you can give God that God hasn't, isn't able to take from you is your love, if you think about it. Your will, your love, your, your will to love God. Now, if, if you imagine that for a moment from God's perspective, you've created billions and billions and billions of children. And in your love for them, you've given them all the ability to not love you. And in fact, a lot of them don't. Huh? What do you think you would feel when somebody decided to love you for the first time? Yeah, it would be great. Wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It would be something you've been longing for all of their existence, longing that they'd come to terms with it themselves, that they'd actually desire it from within their own heart. And then all of a sudden they desire it within their own heart for some reason and away they go and all of a sudden they start wanting to love you. You, you can feel the emotion that would be present, yes? It would be just a... You imagine, a, you imagine as a parent having a child and then the child's 100 years old or 200 years old, 500 years old, 1,000 years old, still doesn't love you. And then all of a sudden the child decides to love you. How, how much of an effect that would have on the parent. That's the effect we have on God when we love God. It's the same effect. Right? And, and when we first engage this desire to love God and we first engage it, it's like you can imagine God in the, up there, wherever God exists, beyond those universes that we've been talking about, just leaping for joy in her heart as a result of one, just one, of God's, you know, pinnacle of creation, God's children, one of God's children deciding to love God for the first time. And then how would you feel once that love became permanent? That that would be a, such an incredible time, wouldn't it? To, you know, it's a bit like, you know, when you first discover somebody in a relationship, initially there's, you know, oh, I'm a bit interested. <laughs> and that's nice feeling, you know, having someone a bit interested. Well, for most of us uh, on the planet who have some form of a connection with God, we're really just still a bit interested. <laughs> we're not really yet in the state where we're permanently interested in this relationship with God and, in fact, have that as our very first relationship, right? When we go through this process of becoming permanently interested in God and, in fact, putting that as our very first thing in our lives, that the very first thing that guides our entire existence, that's another milestone in our relationship with God. Then another milestone in our relationship with God is once we get to the point where we're permanently connected with love, like God can give love any time she wants and we are ready to receive it. And we desire that love all the time, all the time. That would be another milestone, wouldn't it, in, in the relationship, just like it would be in a normal relationship. So, so you can see that there are milestones in our relationship with God. When the, when the person has had no interest in God at all first demonstrate some interest like you did four years ago god's heart leapt yes and and god felt that and and feels that as an emotion of joy but luli still doesn't want god all the time right <laughs> so god's waiting for that milestone to to be reached once that milestone is reached now now you know there's a real development in the relationship yes and then once Luli reaches the point of having a permanent connection in the sense of wanting God's love all the time and being able to receive it at any time and there being no impediments to reception of that love, that'll be another milestone in the relationship. And, and every single one of those milestones, God has a different response to, just like you would if you, you had a relationship with somebody else. It's like when you first meet somebody you're interested in, Oh, you're slightly interested, right? You know, and then you feel drawn, you feel drawn. But, you know, you're still working, you've still got other friends, you still visit other people and whatever else. But then after a while, you get really interested in this person and you get to the point where you're so interested in the person that that person becomes your highest priority. 
then the second milestone is reached. Now you want to work on the relationship between you and that person constantly. You don't want to get distracted by lots of other things all the time. You're trying to focus more and more on that relationship. <clears throat> and so now your relationship has the potential to grow even more rapidly. Now imagine once you get to the point where both of you feel completely connected to each other permanently. Now that that is that is not yet occurred on earth for any relationship. Right? But imagine if it had. Oh, okay. You and God in the first century. Me and God, but not in not. my relationship with, with Mary or right. my soulmate. That didn't happen in the first century because we were in different conditions. So for that to happen, both the partners have to be at one with God for that to actually occur. Now, you imagine in the development of your relationship those three milestones. Well, that's the same three milestones, if you think of it, as, as what's available in God. But then there's a fourth milestone for, with our relationship with God that the other half of me merges with me while we're merged with God. So there's another milestone in the relationship. And I don't know beyond that how many more milestones in our relationship we possibly could have, but I'm assuming in an infinite relationship there's a potential of even more milestones, right? And, but if, even if you look at those four milestones, every single one of those milestones has, a, has an effect on God's heart has an effect on God's feelings for us and also about us. Um, and it's very, very different from God just observing our life. So, so before you met God, and I'd say the first time you longed for God was the time you met God, right? Before you met God, God was just sort of observing your life. God, God was attempting through all of the things you were experiencing to help you recognise that you could have a connection with God. And God was trying to main, have some form of connection with you by doing a lot of external things to your life. But you imagine the very first time you got, went, and I can have a personal relationship with God, imagine how much of an effect that would have on God. It's, it's, it's the same as you observing someone you love and them not knowing you exist. And then all of a sudden, they notice you. <laughs> how would you feel? Yeah, and that's the same feeling God has that God all of a sudden feels this feeling of, wow, this person now wants to have a relationship with me, which is different than me just observing her. Now I can be more personally involved in her life. You know, now I can have a relationship. Before it was just like I've given her all these things and everything, but no relationship. But just I can just watch her up until then. And I can affect her life through external events, but I, I can't really do anything more with the personal relationship. And then all of a sudden there's this personal relationship. Imagine the effect that would have on God. Yeah, it, and it does have a very, very powerful effect on God. Every single individual who decides for the very first time to connect to God has a very big effect on God. And I feel in a lot of ways the love that we have, although it may, in comparison to God, be very small, the love that we have is something that does not belong to God. It only belongs to God when we give it. Yes? And you think about it. If I love God and you love God and then others start to love God, then of course God's going to feel more than when God was just observing. Yeah? Yep. Just like if I love you and then somebody else loves you and then somebody else loves you and then all these people start loving you, you will feel different than when nobody loved you. <clears throat> it's exactly the same. So, um, how does it kind of blows my mind trying to work out how God can keep an eye on everybody all at the same time? Yeah. So, how can how does God answer our prayers? How how does it how? <laughs> um, I think the subject of prayer is almost a completely different subject, but but let's look at it um, in a sort of a generalised form, shall we? Because it does portray to one of, uh, it does talk about one of God's characteristics or attributes, or, or many of them actually. When we examine prayer and the potentiality of communication between our own soul and God as a soul, if you like, or as a being, then, then we can see that there has to be certain conditions available before we can engage in this communication. It's a totally different thing for me to have a thought and go, oh yeah, you know, oh, it'll be a nice thing to have God's love. 
Now, did that sound to you like I was very passionate about the idea? No. No. Didn't sound like there was much desire. It just sounded like there was a smidging of a thought uh, of, oh, maybe I could do that, you know, and I could. Okay. Like, so I'm not really that interested. That's a lot different, isn't it, than if I just go, I have to do this. Like, I'm going to do this. Like, there's a lot more firmness in me. And there's now feelings in me associated with the thought. So I might have the thought still, which is, I, I, you know, I could have a relationship with God. But the feelings are, I, I desperately want to have a relationship with God. That's a, that's a totally different condition. God feels every single one of my feelings. Every single one of them. And in particular, God feels the feelings that are aimed at God. Just like if I feel you, I can feel every feeling inside of you. Right? And eventually every single person on the planet will be able to feel every single feeling inside of another person on the planet. Right? But the feelings that you aim at me are the ones that I'm particularly open to feeling. Does that make sense? So if you aim anger at me, well, like if I'm open to feeling that, then I'll feel that quite a lot unless I have some... And, and, and if I have some injuries inside of myself emotionally, in other words, I feel bad about myself but somehow, I feel a low sense of worth somehow, if you aim your anger at me, I'm going to feel like I'm to blame and there's something wrong with me and there's all sorts of things that I'll feel based on that feeling coming out of you and into me. Now, if you aim a loving feeling at me, like kindness... Obviously, if, I'm, if I've never had kindness my entire life, then as soon as I felt your kindness, I'd probably be crying. Does that make sense? Because your feeling will engender its response. It's the same with us with our feelings and the same with God with her feelings. God's feelings for us always will, if we're open to them, will always engender a response inside of us. And our feelings for God always engender a response inside of God. They always encourage response inside of God. That's prayer. Prayer is God being able to feel our feelings. And prayer, and God's prayer is being, us being able to feel God's feelings. So, so God prays okay. yeah. to us, if you think about it, in the same way. God prays to us in the way that God desires relationship. God desires us to feel. God desires us to feel God. Therefore, God is praying to us. God's constantly praying to us. God's constantly trying to have a relationship with us. Right? So, so this is what prayer is. Prayer is this communication that occurs between God and ourselves. That's what establishes relationship. So, so I have to have the ability at some point to feel God's feelings for me. Which means I'm going to have to. I'm, I'm going to sometimes get confronted, just like when you had certain feelings for me, I got confronted. So when you had a feeling of kindness towards me, and I felt pretty bad about myself, I had to cry. Imagine what it's going to feel like when God feels kindness towards me. I'm probably going to cry for a few days about that one. Does that make sense? I'm going to have feelings as a result of God's feelings for me, and I can also have feelings for God that will have a response in God. Right. Now, of course, God doesn't have any sadness inside of her, so she's not going to cry. <laughs> but she will certainly be overjoyed. She will express you know, desire. She will express passion. She will express wisdom, intelligence, personality in, my, in her response to my feelings for her. And so if I see it that way, prayer is really a, a communication of feelings. Now, if God exists outside of the universe... Looking back at our original discussion, right? God exists outside of the universe, and the universe only came into existence after God was in existence. And when I'm having a feeling, which is a prayer directed at God, it has to then be exiting the universe. Does that not make sense? So the substance of prayer, from a from a scientific perspective, and from a from a from a um, from a um, particle perspective, has to be something that exists in God's universe, where God exists. Do you understand what I mean? Um. The particle <laughs> that makes up prayer has to, ex for it to reach God, right. has to exist in God's universe, in God's wherever God exists, right, okay. as well as here. As well as here. And it, does so it come from us? It comes from us. 
this, this particle comes from us. So whatever this particle is that is, it forms this part of this desire or part of the feelings involved with prayer, because it's not a thought. It's not like, oh, I think I'll just have a... I'll just, uh, God, can you give me some love now? Without the feeling involved. That, that rises no higher than our own head, has no effect on God whatsoever. The feeling does have a huge effect on God. So when I have this feeling inside of me, as a, it forms a substance which has the ability to open my own soul to receiving from God. But this substance also has the ability to affect God's soul who exists outside of this universe. Right? So therefore the particle, the prayer, you know, the, the desire itself, is a, is, a, is a manipulation of a particle that exists in the universe in which God exists. Does that make sense? From a scientific perspective, from is a physical it? perspective. Um, the same particle going from me outside the universe to God, or is it some kind of resonance of the particles in between? Well, it has to um, exist in me. It has to exist as a part of my soul. It has to exist uh, inside of myself. So, in other words, there's some particles inside of my own soul that also must exist inside of God's soul. And when I express that particular emotion, a, a desire for God, a passion for God, and so an understanding for God, this particle leaves me and enters God's soul immediately because I can actually receive a response immediately. So therefore, this particle is capable of transcending space and time. Uh, in other words, it is not dependent on the speed of light. It is faster than the speed of light, this particle. And it, it, it results in immediate conversation with God between God and myself. Does that make sense? So this is a, another. These are the kinds of experiments that I was referring to right at the beginning of our discussion, with regard to the particles that exist in God's universe in comparison to the particles that exist in our universe. There has to be some particles that exist in both. Otherwise, prayer would not exist. Does that make sense? Yes. And this tells me things about God's nature as well, that God created particles that are able to transcend uh, time, space, and also physically exit the universe in which we exist and enter another part that is outside of the universe in which we exist, in which God exists. Yes. So these... Um... <laughs> no, it raises a whole other set of questions, doesn't it? Um, perhaps, Lily, that's probably a good place to end this interview, um, and and then good. and then yeah. continue with the other questions that it raises. Because um, if you think about it, so what I've just presented, I've presented firstly a concept that emotions create particles or manipulate particles that transcend ba barriers of the actual universe itself that can enter God's soul and therefore, and also God can transmit such particles via a conduit, via, via the same kind of means, via desire. Separate from the Holy Spirit. Um, separate to because the Holy Spirit. Yeah. These are, these are, but, but all of our feelings for God, so this is our feeling for God, transmitted, it's not transmitted um, necessarily via the Holy Spirit, but, but you could say that, this, that there has to be conduits of, or pathways through which these desires and passions that exist in our soul can be transmitted to God and God can receive them and then God can have desires, passions that evolve our own soul that we can then receive. And this is communication and that's what I call prayer. Uh, does that make sense? And, and what I feel we need to do then is we go, OK, this then tells us a lot of truths about the physical universe in which we live in the sense that it tells us that space and time are able to be... Uh, they are not barriers, for a start, that we believe them to be. It also tells us that we are able to have instant communication to a being that lives beyond our universes. So that tells us that the particles that exist or, 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 or travel between ourselves and God have to exist in God's universe as well as our own. Yeah. 
And so that tells us, uh, you know, there's scientific experiments that we could do about these particular particles. We can find out their characteristics through a whole series of scientific experiments that do not involve particle accelerators and do not involve cyclotrons or any other type of, um, you know, phys physics-based uh, um, thing that we have to create. And this is what I was saying at the beginning too. There are experiments that we can engage in scientifically that are far simple, more simple, than what is currently engaged in scientifically that would tell us far more about the universe if we just understood some of these basic facts about God, God's nature, God's attributes, qualities, the universe and the universe's nature and attributes and qualities. Mm. Awesome. It's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I won't ask any more questions. Then. No worries. So we'll proceed, uh, shall we, at some other time with the other yeah. questions you have. Um, and hopefully, using some of this discussion we've had today, we can, we can elaborate a bit more on maybe some of those experiments, but also elaborate a bit more on God's nature and qualities as well. Thanks, Lily. Yeah. Thanks for your time thank today. You. And we'd like to thank uh, the, the videographers today and the sound today. The sound is Igor over there. If somebody can just point, point at Igor, say hello to Igor. And Lena is on one camera. You want to poke your head around <laughs> the edge of the camera there, Lena. Vlad's on the other camera. And we have a small audience uh, of three or four people who have been listening today as well. I'd like to thank everyone for being present today. Thanks much. Just a bit. <laughs> Good, Lily. That was good. That was great. Thank you. So prayer is the most powerful thing we can access here. Yep. Really, because it transcends time, space, and yep. enters God's universe. Yeah, and enters God. I've never really thought that before at all. Yeah. No, I never even really vaguely oh, conceived of that. It fits instantly, although I like what you were saying, mm -hmm. but then you've been talking about how God's in another unit outside. Yep. Yeah, I don't know. Wow. Yeah. So would gift be then even something that's, that transcends the prayer as well? Sorry? Would the gift be then transcending the prayer as well? Well, the gift usually always involves love. So love, love obviously um, is a part of prayer. Um, it's like every single thing that God ever does. It, there's always love uh, forms a part of it. So, so when I transmit things to God, my love forms a part of it. When God transmits things to me, God's love forms a part of whatever is transmitted to me. Does that make sense? And so gift, a gift is always involved in love, whatever the gift is. So the gift might be our personality trait, it might be knowledge, it might be more truth, it might be some other thing, wisdom, power. It might be all sorts of things that God gives us. And God gives us many gifts, power, wisdom, knowledge, all these gifts that God does give. They all have love that forms a basis of the gift. So, so, you know, whatever we look at in terms of attributes and qualities of God, we need to start with love and love forming the basis of everything else. Yeah. yeah. And, so. and, and then for our prayer to transcend time space and enter God's universe and enter God, it has to have um, um, a desire attached to it. It has to have, yeah. A pure desire. Yeah. From us. Yeah. And, um, Which is a part of love. And then, a part of our love. Yeah, and then therefore our love to receive um, in return of what we're praying for. True, but uh, if you think about it, like, see, a lot of people's prayer comes from their mind, but the mind only exists in the spirit body form. So this is why it has no effect, um, because prayer that comes from the mind doesn't involve love from our soul and it doesn't involve a desire so the part the particle that actually transmits prayer can't be engaged by the mind so therefore prayer from the mind is useless so it has to come from the desire it has to come from the particles it has to be a part of the particles that are manipulated by emotion does that make sense and and the particles that manipulate emotion are the ones that transcend the boundary of our universe the particles that are not manipulated by emotion do not transcend the universe. They stay within the universe. So our, our intellect, our thoughts, can travel distance, but it cannot transcend the universe. Our thoughts will not in, in, enter God's universe, right? Because they are not manipulating the same particles that our emotions are. 
But God can still read our thoughts, right? God can read our thoughts by God entering the universe and reading our thoughts. Does that make sense? So part of God entering the universe, reading our thoughts. Like God can do anything in the universe, just like if we created something, we could do anything in it. You've got a car, you can enter the engine, pull it apart, put it back together again. Well, God can do that with you too. God can enter you, pull you apart, put you back together again. So that means God can read your thought. God has the ability to see your thoughts, but your thoughts cannot enter God. In the sense, oh, in the sense that your thoughts cannot enter God because none of the thoughts you have actually engage a particle that is beyond the physical universe in which you live. Does that make sense? Whereas the feelings that you have inside of you engage particles that are beyond the universe, in, beyond all of the universes that have ever been created. The, the feelings you have engage particles beyond that universe. So those, because they engage those particles, can now be transmitted to other, to, to where God exists. Whereas, and they enter God. The thoughts can't. This is why you can have lots of really bad thoughts about God. Won't touch him. Right? You can have lots of really good thoughts about God. Won't touch him. Because thank God. Thank, thank, God. God. <laughs> thank God. But you can have lots of really bad feelings about God. And they will pass through God. And of course God has no response to them in the sense of no negative response. But they do pass through God. Because they are feelings, and therefore they are able to transmit, uh, transcend the boundary of the physical and spiritual universes. That's so just such it. a great way of looking at it, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's like everything, Barbara. There is a physical, scientific explanation as well as an emotional explanation. The interesting thing is the emotional explanation is always simpler to understand. <laughs> the physical explanation is very complicated and you to know understand. What? So much more beautiful as well. Yeah, exactly, so exactly. Cool. And this is where people who are involved in metaphysics and understanding the, you know, the, the whole uh, physical part of it um, often don't get the emotional part of it. But the, if you can get the emotional part of it, then you'll understand the physical one eventually. Does that make sense? So now that I've described prayer to you in that regard, in the way that I have, You'll be able to get that pretty easily emotionally if you understand prayer. But if you've never thought of prayer, then you'll be thinking, how does it work? You know, because like, <laughs> you've never felt the transmission between yourself and God. You know, you don't really know. Well, prayer and religion to me always felt hollow. Well, a lot of it is hollow. Not all of it, but a lot of it is, you know, because a lot of it is encouraged to come from the mind. You know, obviously anything that's rote, you know, like, you know, say our father 25 times, our father around heaven, you know, that's a rote thing to do. It's not going to involve much of your emotions, except perhaps an emotion of annoyance. And, and as a result of that, God will feel that, yeah, God will feel your annoyance, <laughs> but God won't feel that you're asking God to do something. Does that make sense? God, God, God will feel, God responds to what you feel, because what you feel is the prayer, particularly when it's directed at God. God desires for us. God designed it that way so that we have to access our soul, because He knows that's the most powerful, beautiful part of us. Well, so it's the only real part of us too. Yeah. yeah. So if He if He responded to prayers from our mind, then then we'd be busily doing it in our mind and whole, never developing our soul. It, it always seems to me like He's built into every process um, the best possible thing for our joy, ultimately. Like, yeah. Like, Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And just as an aside, Igor, you know that uh, recording device that I have that's able to record four channels at the same time? Tuscan. That Tuscan. I'm thinking that when, when we have these uh, talks in the future, that what we can do is have two of them aimed at us, and then you could have one or two of them, one or two of these, pointed at the potential audience. So if there is a discussion that follows afterwards, that you don't have to worry about the sound and you get the sound. Yeah. It's just if there's four mics, you might introduce a lot of unnecessary. Well, you just turn them off through the discussion, yeah. and then as soon as we sort of tell who's here, yeah, yeah, let's use it. Yeah, we could use that. Yeah, you could also, if you wanted, to just have one on a boom sort of almost thing, mm -hmm. um, or one on a transmitter going into the. Because I've got those transmitter things now that you could just plug one onto the, you know, the transmitter and a receiver on on the recorder. And you could actually, you know, handheld mic for and anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we might might do that as part of the kit. AJ, they could probably cut that out, can they? 
Um, we probably won't record anymore because we've got to stop. Because okay. um, because we haven't set up for Mary's book yeah. club yet. That point you made on humility, though, just very quickly. Yeah. Um, I've often prayed for humility to enter me. Yeah. And at times I felt that I have become more humble without yeah. any emotional changes myself. Yeah. So, but what you said today, that's possible. Yeah, of course. It's just, yeah. <laughs> I think does you can have prayed for the quality, but even though you sort of do it sometimes when you're praying to God. Mm. Like you asked to be more humble, like to be shown. Yeah, anyway, it was just interesting oh, what you said. It does enter you. Yeah, I felt some. Awesome, guys. Thank you. Thank you.